you're muted. Is that a yes? Yes, sorry, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, so as she said, I'm Dr. Joanne Yanez. I'm the Executive Director for the Association of Accredited Naturopathic Medical Colleges and uh, going to talk to you a little bit today about my journey and my path as a naturopathic physician. Uh, so uh, before I start on, you know, what is naturopathic medicine, I just thought I would tell you a little bit about myself. Uh, so let's see. I wanted to be a doctor. Actually, I wanted to be a singing doctor uh, when I was two. And uh, from there, figured, okay, I think the doctor part's a little bit more stable than the singing part. So um, I very much pursued that uh, throughout high school, I thought I was going to be a psychiatrist. So I volunteered on suicide hotlines as a teenager. I was a, I'm dating myself here, a candy striper in a hospital. And uh, yes, they had those and we had the outfits too. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and, and from there, I chose a, a an undergrad program that had a really solid pre-med track and was really excited for that. Uh, at the end of my freshman year of college, uh, arranged for a psych research project for myself at the local psychiatric hospital. And the very first day on the floor realized that, wow, this was just not what I thought it was going to be, and it wasn't for me. And so I started on this journey of trying to figure out, well, what was for me? And I knew in my heart of hearts that I wanted to be a doctor that really focused on relationships, um, that understood the power of nutrition, the power of our bodies to heal ourselves and physical medicine and things like that. And so I started looking at all of these different tracks. I'm like, okay, if I go to the conventional route, then I need to take a degree in nutrition. And what about physical medicine and, and all of these things. I'm like, oh my God, I'm going to be in school until I'm like 70. <laughs> so I just started looking at all of these different pathways. I thought, well, maybe I'll go into research. And, and so I just really started turning over a lot of stones in my own journey to finding my way. And my mom in the meantime was like kind of, you know, in my ear, why don't you talk to this, you know, this chiropractor? And I said, I, I don't know that I want to be a chiropractor. I really want to be a doctor. And, um, uh, I, so I finally, finally caved in and, and spoke to him and he was so gracious and so wonderful. And he actually told me he had gone through a number of additional trainings himself, acupuncture school and nutrition and a whole bunch of other things. And he said, you know, there's this other pathway called naturopathic medicine. And I like this light bulb just went off as he started to describe it. I'm like, oh my gosh, that's what I wanted to do. And I didn't know it existed. And so the next day I was on the phone uh, with one of the programs and within a week I was on a plane. So uh, it was that quick and it was that exciting for me personally. And that's how I got to where I am. And my career has kind of taken turns and twists in academic medicine and accreditation, uh, public policy. I was uh, involved on the Hill in 2009 when the Affordable Care Act was being passed as legislation to work to get integrative medicine included. Uh, so it's really been kind of a twisty, turny uh, career of mine and I've loved all of it. And so I'm excited here to talk to you a little bit today about what NDs do and uh, how we work. And if you have more questions, uh, I'll put some contact information on at the end. So naturopathic medicine is guided by six principles. Uh, these are really the foundation of everything. So from the start of naturopathic school, the full four years of it, this is woven through even your academic courses like anatomy and phys. Um, and so first do no harm is inherent in naturopathic medicine. And this typically means that we're going to try and utilize the most gentle approaches to care. Uh, naturopathic doctors recognize the healing power of nature. And so very often, any approach that we're going to take is going to have that in mind, whether it's the person's own inherent nature or that which we use to help them heal. Uh, identifying and treating the root cause was something that really excited me about naturopathic medicine because I had very much in my own health and the health of loved ones seen you know, a diagnosis and a treatment, but not not necessarily understanding the why. And back when I used to have naturopathic students in clinical rotations, my students lovingly nicknamed me Dr. Y, but not because my name is Yanez, Dr. W-H-Y, because I always wanted them to know why the person was sick. And so that was their own little like jab at me, always asking them why. I was like, you're Dr. Y. I'm like, I know, because you need to know why. So the why is identifying and understanding the cause. And very often, I always use this example of headaches. So how, you know, how many of you have had a headache? You know, yes. 
lots of different reasons why you can have a headache. So, you know, assuming it's not anything life threatening, you might take some sort of an NSAID or, you know, some type of anti-inflammatory for the headache. Uh, but that doesn't get rid of the reason why you got the headache in the first place. Is it tension? Is it water? Is it hormonal? And so when a naturopathic doctor is working with a patient, they're looking to that root of the issue and to understand. Uh, and then they will go to the next one, which is physician as teacher, helping to teach the patient why it's showing up and what to do to prevent it. Um, and so that's part of the prevention piece. And then treating the whole person means that we're looking at everything. So when you see a naturopathic physician, they are looking at the totality of the person. It isn't just the symptom that brought them in, the chief complaint. It's really everything. It's your sleep, your stress, your bowel movements, your sexual activity, your, you know, your jobs, your family support, all of it together and what is showing up as a symptom in you could be coming from lots of different places. So the therapeutic order is very much core to naturopathic practice. I always like to think of this slide and my subtitle for it in my own mind is how a naturopathic doctor thinks and how we approach a patient case. And so if you look at the bottom of the pyramid, that's establishing the foundations for health. This is the determinants of health, things like stress, sleep, nutrition, physical movement, lifestyle factors, and so on. And so when a, a naturopathic doctor is focusing on patient care, they're usually going to start there. Now, the high force interventions, things like medications, surgery, et cetera, are at the top. Now, it doesn't mean that we don't do them. It doesn't mean that they're not part of the, the patient care in the case. It's just typically we're not going to go there first. Um, now, that said, I've had patients come in. I'm, I'm, I am no longer in clinical practice uh, full time as the executive director, but I've had patients come in that were emergent. I've had you know active miscarriages currently in place, things that were suspected appendicitis. Guess what? We're going to red. <laughs> you know, we're going we're going straight to uh, referral and you know appropriate care for that. Uh, but most of the things that are going to come in are typically going to be well served at the bottom of this pyramid. And that's the point. Much of what NDC is the chronic conditions, uh, chronic pain, you know, things like hypertension and diabetes, hormonal disorders, things like fatigue and depression and anxiety. Those are the types of things, gastrointestinal stuff, all of those itises that come in and are often really well served. Uh, so one of the things that I saw in my classmates, uh, and I have, I'm married to a physician, I'm married to a medical doctor, but, you know, one of the things that I saw in my classmates that was different than the medical students that I've seen uh, sometimes is very much, there was this desire to have this holistic approach. Um, and so, you know, really focusing on all of the different pieces, really developing that relationship with the patient is very valuable and important to folks that often go this route. So, uh, you know, the science and the art of medicine is something that I think many ND students are drawn to. The fact that you can personalize how you practice, you can create this practice that makes sense for you. Uh, and so in my class alone, my class of, of uh, you know, 50 students, we had folks from all different types of backgrounds, first off, um, everything from traditional pre-meds like myself to uh, second career folks who were in nursing and you know, all different types of backgrounds. There was even a, an old construction worker who was one of my classmates, uh, some massage therapists, an accountant, an engineer, like the, there was everybody. Uh, but one of the core kind of threads with all of us was that we wanted to individualize this. There was an art to the science as well as the science. Uh, there was also a lot of social concerns, uh, connectedness to the environment uh, and, really wanting to make that difference um, and not so much as, as worried about the status uh, of, you know, being a doctor and being called a doctor and being a physician and what have you. Uh, so those are just a few of the things that we've seen. Uh, some folks came because of cultural backgrounds, uh, like myself, I'm Cuban American and uh, also Russian and on both sides, uh, there was a lot of the traditional medicines like, you know, grandmas would be making teas and, you know, all that kind of stuff. And, there, and so much of what I saw in natural medicine, naturopathic medicine was already very familiar because 
um, but it was the evidence component. So like, whereas grandma might have been making the tea, now I understand why the tea works or the chicken soup with the garlic in it. Okay, now I understand the actual components of Allison in the garlic and why those are antiviral and why would they why they'd be used in a soup when you're sick. Ah, makes sense. So for many times we'll see people who are uh, inspired by the things that they seen in their life's experiences. Uh, so as I said, the age distribution, we have many conventional pre-meds, but then we also have a fair number of, of uh, career changers that choose this uh, in majors, lots of bio majors, but also lots of folks who take other routes. And I think that's why we're here today to understand all of the different ways that you can be a health practitioner. Uh, so in the ND curriculum, the first two years are very similar to conventional medical programs. Um, I like to call them all the ologies. Uh, there were a lot of late nights in those first two years. I will, <laughs> I will admit that. Uh, lots of classwork. So all of the ologies, uh, anatomy with human dissection and phys and biochem. But the one thing, remember I talked about the, the principles. So in these first two years, those principles are being woven through everything. And so biochemistry is going to be taught biochemistry. Like I always joke, you know, in anatomy, the bones don't move because you study them in naturopathic school. You know, the, the nervous system doesn't change. Like the nervous system's the nervous system, biochem's the biochem, but there is an emphasis in naturopathic school to cover the interconnectedness. So if you're talking about the biochemistry of the liver and metabolic pathways, that's also going to relate to the hormonal and the endocrine system. And it's going to relate to detox pathways and what you eat. And, you know, and everything is going to be woven together. And so, you know, in these ologies, you're, you're laying the foundation, the framework for understanding how it's all connected. Does that make sense? And I know we're all on mute, but yes. <laughs> This is weird. I'm used to being in a classroom where like I can interact with people. So I, I, you see I'm talking with my hands a lot and I'll be moving because I'm just used to like being in front of people. So anywho, don't mind me and, and the hand motions. That's my old New Yorker. I can't get rid of her. Um, so long story short, the first two years are very focused in laying that foundational framework. There's pharmacology, uh, neuroscience, human path, et cetera. And so you're laying the framework to be able to diagnose and treat. And so diagnosis is also very similar. So there's the clinical education focuses on diagnosis, triage, and all of that. But the difference and the wonderful thing is that in that clinical education, along with all of the diagnosis and treatment, you're learning how to do so and, and address that root cause, like I talked about, and do so with natural medicine. And so in the clinical component, uh, there's a minimum of 1,200 hours. Most students do more than that. Uh, and that's going to occur right now in the time of COVID. It's, it's a bit more telemedicine focused because everything has had to move online. But under normal circumstances, uh, there are lots of community shifts, lots of medicine out in the community, in addition to the academic medical centers and really exposing yourself to how to apply what you've learned in class. Uh, and so the therapeutics that you get, nutrition, as I said, usually at least a couple hundred hours, mind-body medicine, lifestyle counseling, uh, hydrotherapy, homeopathy, botanical medicine, and manipulation. There's also IVs and minor surgical procedures and all sorts of stuff that will get woven in uh, in the ND therapeutics and the clinical component of the education. Uh, so like I said, it's really, it's an intense program. Uh, many of the schools also have dual degrees. And so while I was in school, uh, I also studied acupuncture and Chinese medicine. And so I was doing both together, uh, which was insane. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, but, but awesome because I was getting to apply everything all the time. And, you know, I would see my Chinese medicine cases, but I would also be thinking in my head, okay, what would I do if this was just a straight naturopathic shift? And so it was, it was kind of double the focus in my own head of how I would work through cases. And it was just more tools in the tool belt honestly. Uh, so uh, as we see in naturopathic school, uh, this is from a survey that AANMC did this past year and uh, really showing the areas of focus. And honestly, it's, it demonstrates, like when you look at other health professions, you'll see people who will choose specialties of like 
surgery or ortho or derm or what have you. Uh, but to, to say that 64% of NDs have some component in nutrition and digestion uh, recognizes that at least in the naturopathic approach, like I said, with that therapeutic order pyramid earlier, so much of this of the illness that we see is rooted in digestion, in assimilation of nutrients, in making sure that that foundation for health is intact. And so you'll see that a very large majority of NDs are focusing on the core of health. And so you've got folks in nutrition and, and women's medicine and endo, uh, insomnia and fatigue, uh, but I don't know too many people who have not dealt with insomnia and fatigue at some point in their life. Um, so no surprise that many of these things are very common complaints that NDs work on. So the prerequisites for naturopathic school, uh, undergraduate degree with science prereqs, and you do need to have a very strong science background. As I said, those first two years are intense. Uh, and we wanna make sure that the students are adequately prepared for them. Uh, but then, you know, other things, sometimes students will say, well, I have the pre-med degree already, or I've, I've got the bulk of those courses. Are there any other classes that would be helpful? And I tell folks, you know, there, there are a handful of classes that I would recommend. You know, if you do have the chance to take some biochem, uh, or to take an anatomy course to at least start, that first year will be a little bit easier for you because that first year is intense. Um, I used to teach anatomy and physiology and uh, I actually referenced on my very first day of class with students that they weren't taking a science class, they were taking a language class because you were basically learning how to call things names in the body. And so, and it was a rote memorization course. So, you know, yes, there was the physiology part of anatomy, that's more of the science, but anatomy in its own is really very much a language course. And so the more you can bolster your sense of those things beforehand, the easier it's gonna be. The other coursework that can sometimes be helpful for students is taking some business classes. Um, and even if, you know, regardless of where you wanna go uh, in, your, in your life, a few business classes is always helpful to have an understanding of how to, how to read and negotiate a contract, how to uh, present yourself, how to read financials and understand financial profiles of things. You know, even if you're not gonna open up your own business, those are really good tools to have. Uh, so uh, the prerequisites I already talked about, um, if you are thinking about this as a pathway, I always tell students, talk to an admissions counselor early on, even if you're not, a, you know, for sure associated that you're gonna to apply to a school, start to get an idea of what your academic plan would be, what, you know, what courses you might still need to take and so on. Uh, so the uh, GPA, as I talked about, prerequisite courses, I'm, I'm gonna keep skipping here. Um, so the accredited programs in, in North America are on our website. I'm not gonna belabor it at this point. So uh, if you have any questions, additionally, aanmc.org has all of this info that I'm covering uh, as well. So application materials are very consistent. There's gonna be an essay, there's gonna be an application. And more than anything, the application team is, or the uh, admissions team is looking to see that you've done your homework and that this is really the path where the light bulb went out for you, that this is what you wanna do. Um, and I think honestly, any program is gonna to wanna to really see that you are committed to that track, to that school, to that institution, um, and that it's not a plan B, but this is really your A, your A, a plan. Uh, the other piece of this is that the MCAT is not required. And so uh, we do take, we will take a look at MCATs if they are there, uh, but that's not a requirement for, uh, for application. And right now, uh, in-person interviews are, waived for the most part. So a lot of schools are going to the virtual interviews, uh, but it's best again, because things, you know, travel restrictions are changing nonstop. So uh, I always just tell folks to check in with your programs and, and find out what they're doing right now, because the whole world went upside down on March 13th. So, uh, so now I'm going to talk a little bit about patient care. And I was trying to think about what kind of case I wanted to talk to you all about. Uh, but what I will say is when a naturopathic doctor sees patients, 
that first office call, usually there's a pretty thick intake. Um, and we've all filled out intakes for doctors, but our intake goes into a lot more detail on things like sleep and lifestyle factors and what you're eating and how you want to, you know, how you want to get better and why getting better means to you. Um, and so that first office office visit with an ND is typically going to be between an hour and an hour and a half, if not more. Uh, and the reason for that is because we get into all the nitty gritty and there's a lot of questions that go into much more depth. Uh, I, I think of one, when, so I did a residency after my naturopathic school uh, and my program and one of my supervisors, I always, will never forget this assignment. So here I am, I'm thinking I'm a pretty good student and he stumped me. He said, okay, Joanne, I want you to go in to this patient case, but the only things that you are allowed to say in there, and they had, by the way, it was the closed caption room, so there was a video recorder, so he could see if I was messing up, uh, and he said, he's like, I, you're, you can say two things, and I kind of looked up at him, like, what do you mean I could say two things? <laughs> How do you go into a patient room and only say two things? And he said, you can say, uh-huh, and tell me more. And at first I was stymied. I was like, oh my God, like, what does this man think? <laughs> what is he thinking? How am I going to go in to a patient and say two things? And, and I knew he was watching. So I knew that I couldn't get away with like sneaking around and doing anything else. So I go into the room and I, I interview the patient. I start talking and I followed the rules and I said, okay, tell me more. Mm -hmm. And tell me more. And I just continued to do that. And by the end of the visit, the patient was crying. She said, nobody has ever listened to me like this. And it was so powerful because I realized how much as a doctor, I often interrupted patients. And, and it was just such a powerful moment for me to see what listening and how healing listening could be. <clears throat> and so the first office call is usually going to be long because we're sitting there, we're listening, we're eliciting this, the stuff that maybe people didn't feel safe sharing. Um, and then those return visits are also usually going to be a little bit longer too. And so in that first visit and in those follow-up visits, there's a complete biopsychosocial history, physical examination, labs. Uh, you know, sometimes I would be the primary care doctor for somebody, so I might be doing their annual pap smear, I might be, uh, you know, doing their skin cancer screenings and what have you, uh, or I might be doing acupuncture, I might be doing something totally focused, uh, I might be removing a toenail that was ingrown, like there was all sorts of things that, that fell in there. As I developed my practice, I got much more into uh, cancer and HIV medicine, and uh, and. And so it, it very much took a turn and I really got focused in seeing hepatitis and, and HIV patients. Uh, but it, it was, what, what I will say is, you know, there, there were so many lessons as you become a doctor. Yes, we're here to help people, but there's also times where you learn. And uh, I'll give you an example. I'll give you one patient example of a time where I learned. So I was at an HIV center and I had a student shift of, I think there were six or eight students with me. And uh, my front desk person comes over to the back area, like staging room where we were at and says, Dr. Why, there's somebody who came in, they didn't have an appointment, but would you see them? And I said, sure, well, we'll make some room. And so I, I walk into the, the room and uh, the gentleman was homeless. Uh, he was, um, you know, very, disheveled and, you know, just, uh, you could tell that he hadn't had a, a square meal and a good night's sleep in a while. And, uh, but he was also kind of belligerent. And so, you know, we're, we're in like a little outpatient clinic, like this isn't an ER, this isn't someplace with security or anything like that. And so I told my students, I said, go ahead and take the rest of the patients. I'll, I'll at least work this up and then we can powwow afterwards. And so, you know, as I'm taking the history, he is going on about how he'd been in prison and how many people he'd killed and how he just recently, you know, uh, had to kill somebody to stay alive underneath a bridge. And, and I could tell, you know, sometimes you have people who, I think of it like dogs where, you know, dogs bark 
because they want they they want to show their strength and their dominance and and so you know there was a part of me that was wrestling with this i'm like okay should i be scared <laughs> should you know i'm a little petite female in a room with somebody who's talking about killing people and you know how do i handle this myself uh but i sat and i and i listened and uh I ended up doing a little bit of acupuncture on him and I didn't bring the students in at that point. I just said, you know what, I'm just going to do some acupuncture. And, you know, I remember cleaning him up and getting him some resources. I uh, said, you know, here's some, here's some places where you can get food. Here's some food banks. Here's some, you know, things that you can do to, to, if you want the help. And, um, and he was also, he was a Vietnam vet. He was, you know, he was, a, you could tell there, there was, there was humanity there. And, and so at the end of the, the visit, he left and I honestly didn't really give it too much more thought. We went along our, our business and saw our patients and I don't know, maybe a month or two later, my front desk person comes back over to me and said, Dr. Y, uh, there's somebody here. Uh, he doesn't have an appointment, but he wanted to just uh, see you really quick. And do you have a moment? And I said, sure. So I walked into the waiting room and I didn't see anyone I recognized, uh, but there was a man in the corner and he came over to me and said, and he could see that I didn't recognize him. And he said, it's me. And he gave his name and I said, oh my gosh, you look great. He had shaved, he was clean. And he just wanted to share with me. He didn't want an appointment. He didn't want to be seen, uh, but he just wanted to let me know that after the visit, he went and got help and he was in a halfway house and started counseling boys who were at risk. And he just wanted to come in and check in and say thank you. And it was all I could do to not well up inside because I knew inside I was judging a little bit. And, you know, I was like, oh, you know, here's, here's a homeless person who came in. And, and I will say that that taught me, and I'm being humble with you here, but that taught me we're all human and we all have thoughts and feelings and it taught me that there's humanity everywhere and we have to be open to that. And it's very easy to, in medicine to get jaded. It's very easy to think, oh, here's another person who won't quit smoking or here's another person who won't X or whatever. Uh, and you know, that's, that's a moment where as a physician, you need to check in with yourself and get grounded again. One of the pieces of advice that I always give students, regardless of their pr profession, where they're going, is write down on a piece of paper, take out a piece of paper and write down your why. Write down why you're doing this. Why are you going to school? Why do you wanna be a physician or whatever fill in the blank career you wanna do, but write it down because there are gonna be times in your life that are gonna make you question it. And you're gonna to need to pull out that piece of paper again and remember and remind yourself why you're doing this. There's gonna to be tough times. There's gonna be tests that you fail or patients that didn't work out the way you thought they should. Uh, and reminding yourself of your why is gonna be really important to keep you on track. Uh, there may be, you know, there may be folks that, that try and dissuade you. Uh, I know when I started on the naturopathic path, uh, I had some family members say to me, well, why, why don't you just be a regular doctor? And I said, because this is what I'm called to do. This is, this is my passion. And it's so funny, you know, I, from time to time, when I talk to students, they'll say, they'll say that to me, like, oh, you know, my boyfriend's mom is, you know, asking me why I'm doing this. Uh, you know, and I think of my best friend from, meds, from undergrad, he became a dentist. And he had folks saying, well, why are you going to be a dentist? People hate their dentists. I have a friend of mine who's a teacher. People say to her, why are you going to be a teacher? They get paid so horribly. You know, there's always going to be somebody in life that's going to try and knock you off. And it's up to you to stay on track. And so regardless of what that track is, for me, this was my path. But everyone has their own path. And so it's really being mindful of your why and what you're passionate about and what your role and your place is in the world and sticking to that. And so for me, this was the route. And maybe for some of you, this might be the route or not, but whatever your path is, don't let folks knock you off of it. So um, I know that we have a few more minutes before we go to question and answer. Um, 
and uh, but I wanted to talk just about some of the career options because when I started school, so I'm again going to age myself here. Uh, there was no internet. <laughs> so, well, there was, but it was really kind of wonky and not something that you, you know, found a lot of stuff on. Uh, so I didn't know all of the options that I had and as a doctor and as an ND. And I, I love the flexibility that I see with my colleagues and in my own career. So in addition to clinical practice, uh, there are NDs that become research scientists and get federal grants. There are folks who uh, go into the supplement industry where, you know, they're either formulating supplements or working with, uh, you know, the supplement companies and in that industry, uh, folks that go into administration like myself, uh, folks that are more entrepreneurial and start up their own businesses and, uh, you know, or become consultants. For a while, I was consulting with hospitals that were starting integrative medicine programs. So there are all sorts of different ways that you can use the degree. Uh, there are people who like to do education. And then there are folks who like to do a few things at once. Uh, you know, a lot of times I'll hear from my colleagues, I don't know if I want to see patients all day, every day. I love seeing patients, but maybe not five days a week. <laughs> and, and so what they might do is they might have a clinic where they're working and seeing patients part of the week. And then maybe they're doing one of these other things. Maybe they're writing or they're speaking or they're teaching or they're doing admin part-time uh, and kind of patching together a career that makes sense. Uh, we, we conducted a survey this past year and one of the, uh, there were a few things that came out of it, but one of the things that we saw was folks really appreciate the flexibility in work-life balance uh, that you can have as an ND. And so, you know, when you're thinking about your career, uh, it's not just a career, it's a lifestyle. And what is the lifestyle that you want to create for yourself? When I was in ND school, uh, I was on my clinical ro rotations for labor and delivery for OB and uh, had a family that I followed, a woman that I followed, all throughout her pregnancy, the whole the whole way through from start to finish. And we got to, and I loved, I loved it. I, I loved the visits. I loved working through things with her. Um, and then I had the old pager and I was on call for a month. And while I was on call for a month, I realized, wow, I don't want to be on call like this. <laughs> like this isn't, this isn't what I what I personally, this isn't the lifestyle that I would want for myself in practice. And uh you know, because I had to be on call two weeks before her due date and then two weeks after her due date and she was almost two weeks late. So I was basically on call for a month. I was like, oh, I can't go for a hike because like if I'm all the way up on a mountain and I get the page, I, I, can't, I can't get to the car in time. Uh, and so I just realized that wasn't the kind of lifestyle I personally wanted, even though I loved, uh, you know, in the moment, being with a woman going through that transition, it was just such an amazing thing to be a part of. I knew that as a career, I didn't want to do that, at least as part of ND school. So I always tell folks, talk to as many docs as you can, like look at all the different ways that you can use whatever it is you're trying to do um, and find mentors and find people who you can talk to, who can help you on your path, be the best version of you. Um, and what that requires is honesty. Like you need folks that are going to be honest with you and say, you know, what do you think your, your strengths are? And this is what I'm seeing uh, because we all need feedback, everybody. So uh, career satisfaction is another thing that we see a lot of NDs really feeling satisfied with their choice um, in relation to other professions, uh, usually not so high. So, uh, you know, we hear from, you know, USA News and Report, all of the different news channels that will talk about career satisfaction or dissatisfaction with a lot of paths. And we tend to have much higher satisfaction rates because again, once when you're called, when you feel called to something, uh, there's something so inherently satisfying in doing that. And for it not feeling like work because every day is just fun and cool and filling your cup. So um, at the AANMC, we have newsletters, uh, we have free monthly webinars that are available to students. And, uh, and so it's a really good place if you're just thinking about this or wanting to know a little bit more to stop by and sign up. Uh, we have a webinar uh, coming up in, on depression and then uh, we host virtual fairs with all the schools. And then in December, I think our webinar is on um, 
uh, seasonal flus and how to stay healthy during cold and flu season. Um, and not, not specific to COVID because COVID's brand new and we're all still figuring out how to work with this, but just like your traditional cold and flu season. Uh, and so here's our contact information. Uh, if you want to find out more about us or get, get a hold of me, uh, feel free to reach out. And uh, let's see. And I think that was all I had. So I finished a little bit early. Thank you so much um, mm -hmm. for that presentation. It's super informative. Um, we do have some questions in the chat. Um, so yeah. at this time, students, we are going to be getting our Q&A. Um, if you have any questions um, that came up during um, Dr. Yanez's presentation, feel free to go ahead and drop that in the chat, and our hosts will go ahead and start reading those. So Rafael, are you ready? Yeah. Um, since you aren't doing as much clinical work, what do your typical work days look like? <laughs> right now or normally? <laughs> we could do both. We could do both. So they sure. know what like um, pre-COVID looks like too. Okay. So <laughs> the world pre-COVID, what was that like? Uh, so pre-COVID as, as an executive director, so I'm an executive director and I work uh, as kind of the the puppeteer, so to speak, you know, the, the traffic director of all of the committees. So AANMC is the member organization for all of the naturopathic medical schools. So I help to coordinate if there's a collective research project, uh, cu curriculum issues. Uh, so my typical day would be meetings uh, with anything from college presidents to deans and uh, admissions folks, residency directors, uh, admission staff, you know, different different committee members and, and all of those folks and kind of coordinating the projects that they're working on uh, and providing leadership and direction. Uh, there's networking, there's legislative work that's part of that. So, uh, you know, there, there have been a lot of executive orders that have been coming out recently uh, that have implications in education and health healthcare delivery. And so there's been a lot of work that we've been doing as a result of that uh, in the past, you know, six months or so. Um, and then, you know, there is under normal circumstances, there would be travel. Uh, so I might be going to conferences or uh, speaking and presenting uh, at, at different an, an events. Uh, and so under normal circumstances, you know, I'm typically traveling about 20% of my time and then, uh, you know, working and doing meetings and other things the rest of the time. As an executive director, there's also administrative work. So I might be preparing budgets. Uh, you know, preparing strategic planning, leading strategic planning. So there's been a lot. So throughout the course of my own education, yes, I went and got an ND and I did a residency and I also studied acupuncture. Uh, but I also, I went and got a master's in public health uh, later on. And uh, because I recognized I, I loved, so kind of throughout the course of my, my life, I, I practiced, I taught, uh, I got into academia and accreditation, I got into public policy, and then I'm like, wow, I like public policy. Who knew? I didn't know. <laughs> and so I went and got my public health degree. Uh, and, and when I started this position, I realized, oh, I have never run an organization before. Uh, I've been on boards, but I didn't run one. And so I realized I wanted to increase my own education. So I went and got the certification from the association, the Society for Association Executives, uh, and that was helpful for me to better understand the inner workings of being an association executive as I am now. Um, and so, you know, I'm I'm a member, and AMC is a member, and I'm the representative with other all the other healthcare association executive directors. So, pharmacy, medicine, dentistry, and so on. And so, we all meet. So, there are all different types of things on a normal day to day that would be part of my job. What I will say is COVID, and I'm sure any of you in school. You know, you, you got the student end of it, but on our end, basically, well, my, our first school closed actually on March 7th to campus courses. Uh, and so on the back end, we were in San Diego at our annual meeting and just, you know, crisis, crisis management. Uh, so it was immediate crisis management of how do we close all of these campuses, keep our students and our staff and our faculty safe, 
and, uh, you know, get people back from externships, get, you know, it was just, it was kind of like traffic control. Uh, you know, how do we shift all of our courses online? How do we, you know, close clinics and make sure that our patients aren't abandoned? Uh, and so, you know, COVID really posed challenges to those of us in healthcare education. I, I liken it to 9-11. I have a, a, a good friend of mine who was an air traffic controller on 9-11 during 9-11. And he was in the greater DC area and basically had to land everybody that was up in the air. And that's kind of what I felt like it was not 9-11, but I felt like we just had to land everybody right away and get everybody down and off, off clinic shifts safely. Uh, and so since then, it's been working with accreditors, uh, working with testing agencies, making sure that the students can continue their education, uh, you know, get their tests, get licensed, get graduated, start working, be successful, all of that in light of all the changes that have happened. So uh, the days have been longer. <laughs> the Zooms, Zoom calls have been more frequent. Uh, uh, you know, Zoom, Zoom fatigue is real. <laughs> so, uh, but one thing I will say is that I am grateful for my naturopathic education, even though I'm no longer practicing. In the beginning of all of this, I started having neck pain. I started having like weird elbow pains and things. I'm like, what the heck is going on with me? <laughs> like, why am I, you know, why is my body reacting like this? And I realized I was like, oh, I'm leaning on my desk because I'm at my desk for like 14 hours a day. Uh, and so, you know, I just started to, I had to tune in. I had to use my own medicine on myself. And so Dr. Heal Yourself is something that it was actually a class we had, uh, but, uh, you know, so I, I personally realize the value in my education, not just for patients, but for myself. Uh, and I hope that answered your question about my regular day, because it's not regular right now, but. <laughs> yes, thank you so much for that. Um, so our next question would be, did you teach and work as an ND at the same time? If so, how did you balance these two responsibilities? I did. Uh, so <clears throat> when, when I was in my residency, part of my responsibility as a resident was to take on, you know, TAing some classes and teaching some classes in addition to the patient load. Um, and so in academic medicine, there's usually a, a balance of both of those where you're doing some teaching, uh, and, and even if you have students on your shift, you're still teaching them, you're helping them learn their craft. Uh, but, you know, you, you do it, you, you know, it's, it, it isn't too much different than, you know, anything else uh, where you just have to learn how to prioritize uh, and balance and, you know, and figure out how also to take care of yourself and to keep yourself okay <laughs> throughout it. But you do it. It's, it's really not that tough. Um, another question is, what is the difference between osteopathic medicine and naturopathic medicine? Good question. Um, that's one that comes in quite a bit. Um, I always leave it to the osteopaths to describe what they do themselves. Uh, but what I will say is that in naturopathic medical school, uh, the focus on holistic medicine is from day one and throughout the entirety of the coursework. And so, yes, we're getting diagnosis and treatment. Uh, from a conventional model, but when you're when we're seeing patients, it is always from the naturopathic paradigm, and it's always from this holistic paradigm from start to finish. And so, with naturopathic medicine, uh, it to me is the most direct way to become a doctor if what you want to do is to be in, in integrative medicine. I have friends of mine that work at the Osteopathic Association. I have friends of mine who've gone through the osteopathic program. One very good friend of mine is a dermatologist and she does conventional dermatology. Uh, so, you know, if you're, if you're interested in very much the integrative medicine model from day one and you know that's what you want to do, this is the most direct way to do it. Did that answer? So, yes, it did. Thank you okay. so much. Uh, so our next question would be, um, when or why would a patient go to an ND versus an MD? Good question. Uh, so naturopathic doctors are primary care physicians who specialize in natural medicine. So you have patients who see NDs as their primary person, where 
that's where they go for their well checks. That's where they go for their annual pap or their pelvics or, you know, whatever it is that they're needing for their annual visits. Um, you also have people who recognize that they want a more holistic approach uh, and they want somebody who is going to address all of the different facets in their life, um, whether it's mind body, as I talked about, stress and sleep. And, and so typically the patients that are drawn to this and it's growing too. Uh, you know, when, when I was, when I was a kid, <laughs> uh, I, it always makes me kind of chuckle when I say that, but, but when I was a kid, the only place where you could get, you know, herbs and supplements and things like that was like the hippie co-op store. And now it's everywhere. Like you have, you know, Whole Foods and Trader Joe's and, you know, all these places that have organic food. And like, it's not weird anymore. It used to be kind of a little weird. <laughs> you know, it wasn't, it wasn't the mainstream store that sold all of this. And now people recognize that eating holistically, you know, eating healthfully, eating whole foods, taking care of yourself and, you know, taking responsibility for the things that show up in your body uh, is, is a way that they want to go. Um, there are a lot of folks that I hear from that want the root, root cause focused medicine where they don't want to just, you know, maybe have a symptom managed and here, take this medicine for, you know, infinity, but no, I, I don't want to take this medicine for infinity. I want to get to the root of why it's showing up and not have to take anything. Um, and so there are a lot of folks that, that are drawn to that component of naturopathic care where they want to understand why they've had this skin rash forever and not just take a cream when the skin rash comes up, but to get rid of the skin rash once and for all. Um, and I'm just using that as an example, but that would be the type of folks that would come in are really wanting to get to the, to the root of what's wrong um, rather than, you know, patching up something and kind of just, you know, symptom managing. Is that clear? And it's tough for me because I can't see all your faces and see if you're like getting what I'm saying or if you're totally lost. No, it's totally good. Um, okay. How do you define synthetic versus natural medicine? So synthetic is uh, man-made, right? So natural therapies are things that are derived from nature. Uh, usually synthetic is going to have had, you know, and, and there's a time and a place. Uh, there are some some components that you can't take enough, uh, you know, you can't get to a therapeutic dose with a natural, you know, straight from nature thing. You might have to alter it somewhat to get to a therapeutic dose. Uh, so that's, that's really where, you know, synthetic comes in, but, you know, natural is typically derived straight from nature. How closely do NDs and MDs work with each other? Very. Uh, sorry, I didn't mean to be flipped there. Uh, <laughs> so one of the things that we're seeing increasingly is team-based care, where it isn't just, you know, a doctor alone seeing a patient, but very much, you know, our graduates now are going out and they're working in team approaches where there may be a nurse practitioner, uh, a DO or MD, uh, you know, massage therapist, a nutritionist, a psychologist, all underneath one roof and working in a, in a team approach. Um, I have a number of colleagues who had worked at the Cancer Treatment Center of America Hospital chain uh, that is across the U.S. And they very much focused on a team approach where they would have you know, conventional oncologist, radiologist, surgeon, you know, all of the conventional team. And then they would have, you know, a, a counselor and a naturopathic doctor, you know, to understand the drug herb and drug nutrient interactions, make sure that any supplements a patient was being given would not either upregulate or downregulate the medications that they were being, being given and the therapies for their cancer. So very often we're now seeing NDs as part of this team-based team-based approach. Um, and it's, it's very much uh, increasing in how medicine is just practiced now. Uh, you know, you've got electronic health records that also make it a lot easier for people to communicate um, so that everybody has the record, everybody knows what's going on, uh, doctors can, can work well together uh, via that mechanism. 
uh, and it's you have NDs who may have specialties where they cross refer. Uh, I've got a good old friend of mine from school who is a naturopathic oncologist, and he works very intimately with his patients, cancer doctors, with their radiation radiologists and their surgeons and so on. So uh, it's, you know, it goes both ways. Um, what is the timeline from applying to ND school and actually starting it? Uh, so the application process is similar. So you'd be applying now. Uh, schools are on rolling admission. So uh, what happens is you apply and, uh, you know, based on how quickly the class fills up, uh, there, you know, there may be some later seats in some programs of students, you know, right now, especially with COVID, people's life circumstances are changing so rapidly uh, that, you know, what you may have been able to do, you might not be able to do. So, uh, you know, we're, we're recognizing that, but there's rolling admissions uh, for ND schools. So, uh, you know, it's typically you apply and then that following fall, you would start. A uh, few of the programs do have mid-year starts. So uh, you might be able to start in the winter time in some of the programs as well. Sorry, I couldn't unmute myself for a That's second. Okay. Um, uh, so where do the NDs work and do they hold positions in the hospital as well as or only in private pa uh, practices? Sure. Uh, so naturopathic doctors are all over. Um, gosh, I think there was on our website, we have uh, a slide on our, I believe it's our career page um, that, that answers that question. Uh, typically NDs are going to be in outpatient uh, practices. So integrative medical centers, uh, solo practices, et cetera, but usually out, outpatient. Uh, there are some that will be working in hospital settings, but most mostly uh, ND practice is going to be outpatient. And then, like I said, NDs can also be in academia. They can be working in other types of lines of work uh, in addition to the clinical component. Um, can an MD student take related ND courses and balance therapies between the two areas? So to my knowledge right now, there is no dual enrollment, uh, like concurrently for MD and ND school, um, but there are MDs who have gone through the program afterwards, so, and, and vice versa. Um, you know, sometimes a student will say, you know, I want to you know, continue my education. Um, we do have MDs. In fact, we had a webinar last year and the year before with MDs who changed routes and became naturopathic doctors afterwards. Uh, there's usually some advanced standing that they'll be eligible for, uh, but they would have to go and take the naturopathic therapeutics courses because that wouldn't have happened in MD school. Um, so our next question would be, as you said, naturopathic medicine looks um, holistically at the patient and not root causes of symptoms. Why do you think this practice isn't used more widely? Oh, um, it, it is used widely, but I think it's, it's a numbers game. So we're a small profession. Uh, you know, there are hundreds, hundred thousand plus you know, conventional practitioners and maybe, you know, a little under 10,000 for naturopathic doctors. So part of it is just numbers. Uh, you know, the, the profession has been emerging and growing over the last number of years. Uh, I, I graduated actually 20 years ago this year. Uh, and when I, when I was a student, there were three schools. And so, you know, we've doubled that. Uh, and the num the you know the areas where you can practice fully have also grown. So it's it's a growing profession, uh, and I think part of part of the piece of that is just the fact that we're a growing profession, and so uh, we're we're catching up to the interest. Um, just piggybacking off of that, how long has this degree been going for? Oh, going on for sure. So naturopathic medicine has. Uh, dates of the, the late 1800s. Uh, 
And uh, in, in the early 1900s, there was uh, something called the Flexner Report, so a little hit medical history lesson. Uh, the Flexner Report was commissioned and uh, looked at all of the medical practices, so chiropractic, osteopathic, met naturopathic medicine, homeopathic medicine, and basically standardized the course of medical education in the United States. Uh, medicine used to be a... a you know, kind of like a preceptorship position where there wasn't formalized standard medical education. You, uh, you know, you worked with a doctor as an apprentice and then you became a doctor. And so uh, what happened in the early 1900s was medical education became standardized, uh, but chiropractic education, osteopathic education, all of those kind of closed down uh, with the conventional MD being the standardized route to becoming a doctor. And so what we saw was over the, the remainder of the 1900s, all of these professions gradually started to come back up again. And so had to you know, basically reemerge and, 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 and pick up where they left off. And so uh, we are an old profession. Uh, many of the older practice licensing practice acts actually date back to the 1920s for naturopathic physicians uh, and like places like Connecticut and so on. So there are some very old practice acts there, uh, but interestingly enough, it was, you know, kind of the numbers declined through the 1950s and then in the 60s and 70s started coming back up to where we are now. Um, how would you go about finding a mentor? Network. Uh, a lot of networking. Mentorship is kind of like dating. Like you can't just, you can't force it. You can't force somebody to be your mentor. You can't force someone to, you know, you have to hit it off. You have to have, you know, it, it's got to work um, for both parties. And so, you know, the way to do that, honestly, is mentorship is, is network, go to different types of events. Uh, when, when I was a student, uh, early on, I was trying to broaden my naturopathic trait, my clinical training. And so I went through, I'm embarrassed to say this again, uh, but I went through the phone book and I started calling, just calling up doctor's offices and saying, Hey, would you take a preceptor? Would you take a shadow? Can I come and, you know, uh, you know, watch what you do for a day. And, uh, you know, a lot of doctors will be open to that. Like, hey, would, can I take you for tea? Can I take you out for coffee or pick your brain? You know, just start talking to folks. Like if, you know, if you're, if you have a specific area of interest, um, if there's something that you're looking to do, go and seek it out. Uh, they're not going to come to you. <laughs> so, uh, you know, you really do need to be proactive about that. Uh, you can attend conferences as students, uh, you know, don't be shy, talk to folks, talk to vendors, talk to people. And, you know, when it's meant to be, it'll happen. Now, there are formal mentorship programs. Uh, I was actually involved with one as a mentee uh, through the National Hispanic Medical Association. Um, so there are formal formalized mentor programs, but um, there are also other ones. The, most commonly, people just kind of stumble on it. Hi, this one is more like a comment and a question. I feel like all doctors should have a holistic approach when it comes to treating patients. Why do you think NDs are a small profession? Oh, uh, thank you. I agree. <laughs> I think we would have a lot better care, honestly, if we had a more holistic approach uh, to, to patient care delivery. Uh, some of it is, again, like I said earlier, the growth of the profession and uh, you know, growing. Some of it has to do with legislation and reimbursement. Uh, and the reimbursement models that we have in this country currently are fee for service. So when you're sick and you have something wrong, you get paid for the wrong thing. You know, you get paid for the thing that's wrong. Uh, but there isn't in our medical system as much of an emphasis on prevention and wellness. Uh, and so, yes, you can go in for your well check, uh, but you know, it, there isn't the reimbursement in place to you know, have all students go for stress reduction. <laughs> you know, everybody gets stress reduction care taken care of or, uh, you know, preventive massages so that you don't get muscle tension or, you know, what, what, whatever it is. Like, that's not how our insurance system is set up. Uh, if it were up to me, every kid would have nutrition education. 
they would know how to cook. They would know how to prepare their own meals. They would know how to read food labels, know what they were putting into their bodies. Like it, it would just be part and built into our system. Uh, but our system currently isn't built that way. It's just, it's, it's a, a reductionistic approach to thinking about how to manage care rather than a, a bottom up. It's kind of top down. Does that make sense? Yes, thank you. Um, so our next question would be, what uh, what was the hardest class for you during the first two years of your ND program? Hmm. So the first nine months of my program, I was dumb. <laughs> I worked uh, several nights a week as a cocktail waitress to make money. <laughs> And, uh, and so I would like bring my books in and leave them by the bar. And like when I had like a slow part, like kind of look through my anatomy books and stuff. Uh, so it was a little bit weird for me because I wasn't like fully dedicated to only being a student. I was also working, uh, which was exhausting and crazy, uh, but I was 22. So, <laughs> uh, but that said, uh, physiology for me personally was harder, uh, even though I did have a science background, the phys classes of just, you know, understanding like the sodium potassium channels and like all of that kind of stuff, it just, it didn't all the way click for me. And so I had to work at it. Um, I got it, but you know, there, I think for everybody, there are going to be some things that are going to come more easily to you. Um, anatomy was kind of easy for me. It was just, it's like, oh, this is just like learning a language. Uh, you know, you just practice, you know, locations and so on. Um, I don't know. I loved biochem. So I don't know. I, I would probably say phys just because of the technicality of it. But I think everybody's going to be different, honestly. They're, you know, and the other thing too, hopefully at this point, you've already figured this out for yourself. But if you haven't, figure out how you learn uh, because you're not going to have time in medical school to figure out how you study and how you retain and for mass quantities of information quickly. So, <laughs> you know, hopefully you have figured that out by now, uh, but if you haven't do it quick, because by the time you get to school, there is not going to be time to figure out your learning style or, you know, how you retain information. Like, do you, do you need a group to study or do you need to be totally quiet by yourself? Get that worked out now so that you don't waste time because in medical school, you will not have the time to waste. Um, you need to kind of get it down and figure out how you can learn as fast as you can. Thank you. Can you talk about the ND school tuition and how much it costs? Sure. Um, so tuition is going to vary uh, by program. Um, so we have a page on our website. We've got links to that uh, as well. Um, but typically tuition is going to be anywhere from like low 20s to low mid 30s per year, uh, depending on, you know, depending on the school and the location, uh, you know, and cost of living and so on for, for certain areas is different than others. Thank you for that. Um, so would pharmacy industries look down on this type of treatment of naturopathic treatments? Uh, you'd have to ask pharmacy industries. I'm not sure. Uh, you know, I think, like I said earlier, I'm married to a physician. He's actually a hospital administrator now, uh, but retired ER. And, you know, I, I respect what he does um, and he respects what I do. And I think, you know, if, somebody's in a car accident, bring me to the vascular surgeon, bring me to the ER, like I want the best there is. Um, but if there's, you know, underlying metabolic syndrome or diabetes or chronic disease, NDs are very well equipped to manage that. Uh, you know, there, there have been wonderful breakthroughs in pharmacology uh, that have saved lives. And so, uh, you know, I think that there is, and there have also been wonderful, amazing breakthroughs in natural medicine that have saved lives where other routes couldn't. So I don't think it's that one is better than the other. It's that there's a place for all of them. And it's ultimately about the patient, right? It's ultimately about what is best for that person and what's going to get them the best quality of life and have them manage the best. Like, you know, that's what it's about. Like, it's not about me or what I think about pharmacy or what they, you know, it's about the patient. Um, can you talk about how the ND degree has changed over the years? Um, so, you know, I think 
the team approach is definitely very much more prevalent now. Uh, and so we're seeing a lot of that team-based approach to care. Uh, telemedicine is something that wasn't even an idea <laughs> 20 years ago. You know, maybe you had a phone visit here or there, you know, a phone follow-up with a patient, but seeing a, a patient on a Zoom, you know, or seeing somebody physically, uh, I think the technology piece of things has, has improved and increased over the years, uh, utilizing different technologies to incorporate into patient care is something that did not exist for anybody, honestly, not, not to the degree it is in now. Um, and so uh, that is, those, those would be probably the biggest changes I've seen. Thank you. So um, our next question is, how has naturopathic medicine improved studies for cancer research? So, um, you know, one of the things that I hear is, oh, well, is there evidence for this stuff? <laughs> and, uh, you know, th yes, there is. Uh, there is a, a fair amount of literature around natural therapies uh, for all different types of conditions, including cancer. Uh, there is growing evidence as well. And, uh, you know, I think that there are a lot of opportunities for people to learn. Um, sometimes, you know, there's a bias uh, in there, there are biases in life, you know, the, the riots in June, uh, the things that we've been seeing recently in the news, uh, there, there is a fair amount of bias in life. And one of the things that I've realized in medicine is there's a bias in medicine. And we very much have a Western bias in medicine where sometimes studies from other countries may be discounted because they were, they've occurred in other countries or in other cultures. Uh, and so when I hear from folks, oh, there's no evidence for this. I'm like, are you talking about the thousands of studies in China? Or are you talking about, you know, thousands of studies in India? Or like, what, what are you talking about uh, when you say there's no evidence? Um, so on the contrary, there is a, a strong amount of evidence. Uh, it might not be the traditional Western model that we're used to, and but I would encourage people to look at uh, the different layers of evidence, right? So there's there's your double-blinded, placebo-controlled, you know, uh, you know, study, uh, the gold standard study. But then there's case reporting. There's uh, you know, all different levels of evidence when taken in their totality give you evidence. And so it's interpretation of all of the different layers of evidence that can help inform practice. And so yes, there's that gold standard, but there are also many other ways to look at evidence. And so when I when I think about oncology, to go back to the question, uh, there are a lot of studies that exist that are the gold standard studies, and then there are also additional studies that have been done, uh, looking that you know are still emerging and and in in the pipeline uh, that are part of it that demonstrate very good support for many different types of therapies. Uh, there are things that are done in Europe uh, that are very standard treatment in Europe that may not be have caught on as much here. Uh, but, you know, you've got very developed countries doing things that, you know, in Europe, but it's in Europe. So, you know, I would just encourage people to recognize the bias and, uh, and just be open to looking at a global view of how, how healthcare is, is practiced. Um, this is a kind of a long question. In the future, how do you think naturopathic medicine will influence education in grade school in terms of incorporating more focus on nutrition, health, and mental physical well-being? That's my dream. Uh, you know, that's that's honestly my dream. If you think about a true preventive model to healthcare, uh, you start with education. And uh, one of the, the big things we see, you know, even with COVID right now, uh, we're seeing, you know, major health disparities in certain parts of our population in this country, uh, in African American and Native American and Hispanic populations, uh, the health disparities and the education disparities that exist are exacerbated. And so in my utopia, in my perfect world, I would see us starting with kindergartners, you know, preschoolers, education, uh, you know, hospital cafeterias should be the healthiest place to eat. Uh, you know, school cafeterias should have the best food. We should be modeling what we want people to do. 
and making the healthy the normal, not the healthy the weird. So in, in a perfect world, that would be that would be my wish would be to see this as part of all of the education, but instead you have, you know, education cut budgets being cut, uh, teachers salaries being cut, you know, the, like the, those are, you know, that's, it, it isn't an area where as a society that we have valued with our tax dollars to the extent that it would need to be to support those things we're talking about. So ultimately get involved, you know, run for office, in, call your call your elected officials. You know, get get involved because it does take policy, to, oftentimes, to make those types of changes. Um, I'm sorry for the background noise, but okay. uh, the next question would be: Can you go more into depth about the requirements to get into ND PhD? Um, so. Uh, I am not aware of, I know that there are some schools that have affiliate programs with other additional PhD programs. Uh, so that would be something that would probably be best to run through the admissions groups at each one of the schools and what ND PhD programs they have available. Uh, just like you would at you know, any other program, there, you know, there might be a PhD, but it might not be a PhD in something you wanna be a PhD in. So uh, you, you need to you know, just call the admissions folks and find out more info on that. And ultimately, like, what is your career goal? Like, what do you want to do with the PhD? Do you want to research, be a researcher or teach? Like we have, um, I think of like a colleague of mine, Dr. Wendy Weber, who is at the NIH and uh, she has a PhD uh, and uh, an ND as well, but does a lot of the alternative medicine, the integrative medicine research at and NCCIH, which is the National Centers for Complementary and Integrative Care Health in, at DC. So, you know, there's, there's all pieces that you can utilize with that PhD, but ultimately, what, you know, where's your goal? What is it taking you to? Um, you talked about insurance a little bit earlier. What type of things are typically covered for naturopathic treatment versus things that are, aren't? You know, insurance is uh, an insurance plan by insurance plan kind of thing. Um, and so it's going to vary some by state and plans. Uh, I would love to see more insurance coverage. I think that there are some, some states that are really good with insurance coverage for NDs, uh, but it's the big equalizer, right? You know, it's, it, if you have insurance coverage versus if you don't have insurance coverage means what, what is your discretionary income gonna be able to afford? Um, the, the one area that there is not insurance coverage for, for right now is Medicare. So NDs are not covered by Medicare, which means that uh, our older patients have to pay for it themselves. Uh, and and that, is, uh, that is definitely one of the limitations, but uh, there is a, there has been at least increasing insurance coverage over the years. So things like your well visits, your follow-up visits, all of that's gonna be covered, usually depending on the, the plans that you have. Thank you. Um, so our next question is, is there a higher or lower number of lawsuits in ND versus MD? Um, so I don't have the current uh, malpractice data in front of me. My understanding is that, so like I can speak to, you know, think about car insurance for a second. So if you have car insurance, uh, let's say you're an 18 year old male with three tickets versus a 50 year old male with no tickets and a perfect record, who's gonna have higher insurance? So in when we look at naturopathic medical insurance, our insurance is typically at the lowest end of the malpractice insurance scale, which if you're thinking about risk, uh, the types of things we do are usually very low risk procedures. So if something goes wrong with nutrition, like, you know, it's, <laughs> it, it's, it's not a very high risk thing to be working with, um, you know, versus brain surgery. <laughs> so, you know, if you're thinking about the relative risk of naturopathic practice, uh, it is, it, we tend to be on the low end part of the scale for malpractice insurance costs. Um, and so if I were to use that to extrapolate out the risk, uh, we are going to be on the lowest end typically uh, for practitioners for risk. 
Can you talk about some interesting cases that you've been a part of? Sure. Um, any specific areas? Um, just like the ones that like was in like embedded in your brain. I don't know if that's I said that right. Okay. Yeah. Um, so let's see. Uh, pain. So I was a, a new student and I was just shadowing. So I was just kind of on the observation. Uh, and there was a, uh, there were a couple cases that came in with back pain, like excruciating, on disability, can't go to work, can't do anything, uh, you know, really impacting quality of life type of pain. And uh in one of the cases, the gentleman was actually carried in uh, by his family. He had this awesome, so if, you, if uh, those of you who are Latino or come from like, you know, cultural backgrounds, like 10 people came in with this guy, like his whole family came in on the visit with him. And, you know, a couple of his, his family members like literally had to carry him into the room because he was in so much pain, he couldn't walk. And, um, and so, we, we did, we, we worked with him. I did, we did some physical medicine. We did some acupuncture, uh, got him some supplements and he walked out on his own and everybody who was in the waiting room, like they started clapping. And it was just, it was so awesome. It was just one of those, like he, he literally came, was carried in in tears and was able to walk out on his own. Um, and that was one of those early moments for me as a practitioner where I'm like, wow, this stuff really works. <laughs> this is so cool. Uh, I had another gentleman who was on disability, uh, same thing, he couldn't go to work. Um, and the, you know, the, after the treatment, it, I, ha I, as the student was tasked to call him up and follow up and see why he didn't make his next appointment. And he said, oh, cause I'm better. I said, you're better already? <laughs> he said, yeah, I got on my bicycle, I'm all good, thanks. So, you know, there, there are things like that that really stand out for me when uh, another one was a, a female that I saw. Uh, she was in her 60s and her chief complaint was insomnia since she was a little girl. 60 year old woman with not being able to sleep for basically her entire life. And she had seen everybody. She had gone to counseling, medical doctors, acupuncturists, like she did the works. And, uh, and so I saw her and worked through, you know, just kind of did my normal history. And uh, part of me felt that there was something deeper going on. And so I led her through a guided imagery meditation. Uh, and what ended up happening was through the course of that, she realized, you know, I asked her to go to some place where she felt safe and she said she never felt safe. And I said, tell me more. And, uh, what came out was that she was a victim of ritual abuse as a child. Her parents were in a cult and uh, bad things happened at night. And so she was hypervigilant. She couldn't let go of control of trying to be safe. And she had a younger sister. So she, it compounded it because she felt responsible to keep her little sister safe. And so she couldn't, uh, she couldn't relax enough and feel safe enough to relax, to close her eyes and go to sleep and be vulnerable while she was being asleep. And we worked through that uh, and she was able to sleep. And so for me, you know, you can't fix the abuse. You can't go back and take care of that child, but you can give an adult the tools they need to manage it. And so for me, that was really, really powerful. Um, just one of those where, you know, I, I I, I was the conduit. I was there just to help. You know, I don't, I don't heal people. I don't fix people, but I give them the tools that they need to do it. That's wonderful. Wow. Um, so our next question would be, what type of cases would you use herbal remedies? I'm so sorry. <laughs> it's okay. Uh, welcome to working from home, right? Uh, so Herbal medicine is used in so many different types of concerns. Uh, you know, many of you have probably used it yourself and not even thought of it. You know, if you've drank chamomile tea to help you relax at night or, uh, you know, taken 
a mint for an upset stomach, guess what? You used herbal medicine. So, uh, you know, I think there, there are a lot of ways that you can use botanical therapies. Um, and historically, throughout history, throughout many different cultures, uh, you know, in the world, uh, we have the very broad evidence for use of, of natural medicine, whether it is, uh, you know, even, you know, think of digitalis for heart. Well, guess what? Digoxin comes from the fo comes from the foxglove plant, which is which has digitalis in it. So, uh, you know, there are very broad uses for herbal medicine. And one of the things that you get in ND school is a really substantial botanical medicine education on the uses, the contraindications, uh, the drug herb, drug supplement, drug nutrient interactions so that you can manage that, uh, depletion of other medicines, all of that. So uh, I don't wanna say everything, but kind of almost everything. Thank you. Um, how do you manage stress as an ND? Stress, what's that? <laughs> Oh, gosh. Um, welcome to COVID, right? So uh, for me personally, like I have a set, uh, he just turned eight, but I've got an eight year old at home. He's, you know, March 13th was his last day of school. Uh, I work 14 hour days. Um, and like I said earlier, I had to tune in, I had to, learn, I had to use, you know, practice what you preach, right? I had to turn in and figure out my own stuff. And also for him too, um, you know, this is a stressful time for everybody. And, uh, you know, I, I give thanks for the things I have, I have a job, I have a home, I got food in the pantry, you know, there are things that I don't have to worry about that maybe some people do. Um, so I don't minimize the stressors that some folks have right now. Um, but at the same time, you know, this is a stressful time. And so for me, uh, practicing gratitude is really important. Um, if you focus on the negative, you propagate that in your thoughts, you, you, you foster that you, and you give it energy. And so for me in this time, one of the things I did early on I, when I would put my son to sleep at night is, okay, we're going to name three things today that we're thankful for and, uh, and go through that. And so for me, that became part of my own mental health ritual. And I just wrote an article called PPE for your mental health. So check it out if you haven't, if you have some time, and if that's of interest to you. Uh, but really focusing on gratitude is important. Uh, focusing on the positive, having some sort of mindfulness practice. Um, so for some, it's prayer. For some, it's mindfulness. For some, it's just walking out in nature. Um, but having something that you do that helps you center, helps you pay attention. I think the biggest thing that you can do for your own, men one of the biggest things you can do for your own mental health is be mindful. Pay attention. Uh, if you're, I remember the, my first year of med school, one of my friends, we had a physical medicine class where we had to like evaluate each other's spines and all of that kind of stuff. And I'm in this class and one of my friends is like, hey, Joe, lower your shoulders. And I'm like, what are you talking about? I'm like, lower your shoulders. Like, I was so clueless that I was stressed out that I was like basically wearing my shoulders for earrings. I had no idea that I was carrying stress in my shoulders. Um, and, and so... Part of that mindfulness, I think for me personally, like every, every night, uh, I will typically do like a head to toe scan of just a check in with myself. How am I doing? Is there any tension or stress? Am I feeling anything in my body? What's going on? Uh, and so I think, you know, part of that mental health plan for me is a check in and being mindful and being aware and not wearing my shoulders for earrings and not realizing it. You know, it's like, what are the things that we walk around with? Uh, you know, there was a point where I was grinding my teeth. I was having jaw pain in, in school and I didn't realize I was like stressed out. And so I wasn't doing this anymore, but I was doing this. And so it's like, okay, relax your face, relax your face muscles, your face is tight. And so as I go to sleep at night, I'm like, okay, am I carrying tension anywhere? Is it in my shoulders? Is it in my mouth? Is it in my stomach? Where, where am I carrying that tension and that awareness uh, and having, having that personal time to check in? And it doesn't have to be long. It can be 30 seconds, it can be a minute or two. It doesn't really need to be this whole long, big, drawn out thing. Uh, but having your own mental health, uh, because you know we hear about burnout. We hear about all of the things that physicians are dealing with. Physician suicide uh, you know, is, a, is a big deal. It's a real thing. And so having, having ways that you know how to deal 
with your own stressors is going to be really important to make sure that you don't get burnt out, whatever path it is you take. Uh, that that is super important to, to understand. So for some people, it's journaling. Um, for me, my my you know some people started sourdough bread during COVID. For me, I I picked up the piano again and I started playing. I was like, okay, you know, instead of picking up my cell phone and scrolling through Facebook or whatever, I'm going to go and sit at the piano for a couple minutes and play. And so whatever it is, have an outlet, have something that you do that fills you up. Thank you for that. Um, what has been the most difficult patient case that you have treated? If you can talk about it a little bit. Um, I had an atypical appendicitis once uh, that came in and uh, you know, it was one of those where I walked through over and over again and I talked to people afterwards, uh, but he presented totally atypically and uh, we sent, I sent him off to the ER, but I wasn't hundred percent sure where, where it was going. And he was, he was one of those folks, he didn't have medical insurance. He didn't want to go to the hospital. And my gut was just saying, this guy needs to go in. He, you know, something doesn't smell right. Uh, and it taught me to trust to, you know, that gut feeling that you have. Uh, but it was, it was challenging because, you know, it, it bumped into the medical system and, you know, not having insurance and, and that being part of the factor, like this guy was walking around, his appendix had actually already ruptured, which was why he was presenting atypically. Um, and he was taking, which he didn't report to me right away, he was taking his girlfriend's opiates uh, that were, was masking the pain and was masking part of the presentation. So um, it was it was challenging for me because he basically was walking around with a busted appendix in my office, uh, and uh, you know it was one of those things where he he did delay getting in for a bit, and then when he did go in, the appendix had ruptured and it had actually migrated toward his spine and and walled off. So when the surgeons went in. They're like, what the hell? <laughs> you know, they, they opened him up and they had actually opened him up wider uh, because his appendix had ruptured, had migrated all the way to the back of his spine, had encased itself, had kind of re-encapsulated. It was just the craziest, weirdest thing that was totally not textbook. Like it was just something, you know, I talked to doctors afterwards and they're like, I've never in my 20 years of practice seen something like this. Uh, so there are going to be things that are going to stump even uh, seasoned folks and, you know, and, and, you know, they're not, everything is a lot, most stuff can be textbook, but every once in a while, you're going to have a unicorn. So that was thank my you unicorn. So much for, <laughs> thank you so much for answering all those questions. At this point, I'm going to ask, um, do you have any last minute advice or anything you would like to say to like the free health, like free health students here? Yeah. Well, gosh, thank you. Um, follow your path follow your own truth. Don't let folks get you off track on that. Uh, write down your why and uh, seek out mentors where you can. And uh, remember at the end of the day, it's about the patient. So, you know, when, when, you're, when you're questioning, when you're thinking, remember this should always be about the patient. So with that, I bid you all thank you.